Uh, I want to say thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. And everyone, you'll be pleased to know there are only 60,000 bony fishes standing between you and coffee. So we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. Um, we're all aware of the really amazing diversity of vertebrates. But what's perhaps not really appreciated or not fully appreciated is that fully half of these are ray finned fishes. So 30,000 of the 60,000 living bony fishes are ray finned fishes. Um, and probably many of you, when you saw the symposium lineup, thought, oh God, there are three talks about fishes. This is awful. But it's great to see a lineup that's taxonomically balanced. So I'm very excited about that. And as well as this vast modern diversity, vertebrates also have an incredibly rich fossil record. But fossils of ray finned fishes are critically understudied, um, especially in the earliest part of their history. So there are hypotheses of relationships, of evolution, that have gone untested for decades or even centuries. But with the advent of techniques such as CT scanning, we can start to unravel the relationships of osteichthians and ray finned fishes by peering inside their heads of these long forgotten fishes. And please feel free to tweet and take photos of these. There's a few slides at the end that I'd ask you not to, but I've got an icon on there, so it should be easy to, to, pay it, to, to notice which ones uh, I'd ask you not to tweet about. <clears throat> um, I'd like to end with my conclusion, so here are my acknowledgements. I'd like to thank these institutions for funding my work and these people for access to specimens and also for really helpful discussions. So historically, much more attention has been paid to the lobe fin fishes. This is because they chart our own evolution and eventually lead to ourselves. And the same can be said of uh, fossil members of early lobe fin fish groups, because they chart out our own evolution. For example, the evolution of fins into limbs. But ray fin fishes, in, context, in contrast, have a much poorer history, and they've been sorely neglected in comparison to lobe fin fishes. And this is despite the fact that they contain half of all living diversity and are every bit of disparate and diverse as the lobe fin fishes. This is particularly vexing because there are absolutely tons of fossil ray fins. So this is just one of many, many rows of fossil fishes at the NHM, helpfully labelled fishes. Each row has several cabinets. And in each, inside each cabinet are many drawers. And inside each drawer are many fossils. And plenty of these are three-dimensionally preserved. They're beautifully, they have beautiful contrast. And they're ripe for CT scanning and reinvestigation. So my research focuses on, on bony fishes in general, but particularly on the ray finned fishes and the early history of the bony fishes. But we're hampered by a poor understanding of how these groups are related to each other, and particularly the intersection of, of living and fossil taxa. And as a result, there are major gaps in the early records of these groups, which have major problems when we try and understand how they're related, how they've evolved, and how they've grown into the vast diversity that we see today. In particular, there are two critical areas of, of poor understanding. The first of these surrounds the origins of ray finned fishes as a whole, and they're split from the lobe finned fishes. Stem bony fishes are known from a handful of scales that extend back into the late Silurian, but there are only two taxa with recognizable body fossils that can be unequivocally identified as stem bony fishes. And these are both from the Emsian, around 400 million years ago. By contrast, fossils that are readily identifiable as lobe fin fishes extend back to around 425 million years ago. So we have this missing osteichthian stem body fossil lineage of around 25 million years. Because lobe fin fishes and ray fin fishes are reciprocally monophyletic, ray fin fishes must also have evolved 425 million years ago, which is when we see the first lobe fin fishes. But they don't appear in the fossil record until 385 million years ago. So for the ray finned fishes, we have this 40 million year paleontological gap. So we're missing out on a major chunk of their group's early evolution, both in, term, both in terms of the osteichthian stem and the early members of the ray finned total group. The second critical area of uncertainty concerns the origin of the living ray finned radiation. So to understand this, we need to zoom in on ray finned fishes and look at the groups. And these are the five living ray finned lineages. The origin of the crown node, so when the living groups split from each other, is thought to be around 385 million years ago, as you can see from the, the red line on the bottom. And we can compare this uh, crown group age of 385 million years to the fossil record of the living lineages. Definitive members of these lineages are all Mesozoic and younger. And strikingly, Cladistians, this is the group that includes things like the rope fish and reed fish, they only have a fossil record going back to the Cretaceous. Because these are the earliest diverging living group, they diver the divergence marks the age of the crown node. 
So this group has a 285 million year, a quarter of a billion year ghost lineage. That's a staggering, staggeringly long length of time. So my work is chiefly trying to determine when these different groups evolved and how the fossils are related to each other. And from this, we can understand character evolution and major innovations. And of course, without a rigorous phylogenetic hypothesis, it's impossible to do any of the kinds of large-scale macroevolutionary analyses that are now standard in other taxonomic groups. So the first example I'm going to talk about is filling in that gap in early bony fish evolution. As I mentioned, we have this, uh, 40, we have this 40 million year gap in the Rafe and fish fossil record and a 25 million year gap in the bony fish fossil record. So why do we have these gaps? There are two possibilities. Either that fossils are not preserved, or the fossils are preserved and have been identified, but have been misidentified as belonging to a different group. And in order to te tease apart these two possibilities and find out what, what is really happening, we need to reassess how early members of the group are identified and how they're assigned to each of the different lineages. So I work with colleagues in China, the US, and the Netherlands to re-examine this 450 million year old fossil called Mimania. And this was previously described when it was first discovered in, when it was first described in 2006 as a lobe fin fish. And this was on the basis of a character called a poor canal system. And we found that this fossil, when we examined it with CT scanning, had key ray fin fish characters. And this included something called a spiracular canal and a lateral cranial canal, which you don't need to worry about, but they're characters that are only found in ray fin fishes. In addition, we found that key lobe fin fish characters, including that poor canal network, are found in unequivocal ray fin fishes. So rather than being a character that, is defi that defines lobe fins that can uh, assign fossils to that group, it's actually broadly, broadly spread across uh, bony fishes as a whole. So we modified a previous matrix and updated our codes for this taxon. And unsurprisingly, we discovered a, a stemat not to rigian placement for Mimania. And we recovered this under both a parsimony and a Bayesian framework. So this allows us to build a clear picture of character evolution in early actinops, but also feeds back into our earlier question. So we re can return to our diagram of bony fish relationships with this 40 million year gap in early, in early reef and fish evolution. And placement of Mimania fills in a huge chunk of this, extending the fossil record of the group back some 30 million years. At the same time, it shows into sharp relief the discrepancy in the stem osteichthyan bony fish record. The fact that this poor canal system is widely distributed across bony fishes means that we need to reassess early lobe fin fish fossils and work out whether they are truly members of that group or not. And chief among these, is a, a, these candidates is a group of animals called the sarolepids. These are known from the late early Devonian and late Silurian of China. And they're the oldest fossils thought to, be going, thought to belong to the lobe fin fish group. They're known from articulated and three-dimensional fossils and have a really peculiar suite of characters that's seen elsewhere in placoderms, acanthodians, and to some extent, ray-finned fishes. So the current hypothesis of, of sorolepids as stem lobe from fishes requires a huge amount of homoplasy. So all of these characters listed horribly on the screen are required to be lost at the bony fish total node and re-evolved in sorolepids. So this seems like quite a peculiar thing. And in addition, sorolepids lack enamel on their teeth. So this means that either this, these group of animals have lost enamel on their teeth, or enamel on teeth has evolved separately in ray finned fishes and lobe finned fishes, both of which seem slightly curious hypotheses. But the, the, the position of sarolepids as, as stem lobe finned fishes seemed quite robust, even, even given this, this level of homoplasy. But indirect assessment of the bony fish stem has thrown up some objections to this. So first, this is the description of a new taxon of stem lobed in fishes with uh, Tictolepis in conjunction with colleagues in China. This is known from the Pragian of the South China block. And second, reanalysis of the stem bony fish Ligula lepis in conjunction with colleagues in Sweden and Australia. So this was published earlier this year and um, confirms its position as a stem bony fish. And a key result of both analyses is the shifting of sarolepids onto the bony fish stem. Uh, this is in contrast to previous results, which found them on the lobe fin fish stem. Although it's important to point out that they remain on the lobe fin fish stem in the Bayesian analysis, and they're only shifted in the parsimony analysis. So there's something going on there that needs a bit of further investigation. This, is a lot, uh, this result of them as stem bony fishes uh, addresses a lot of homoplasy and also has important implications for the, bony fish, 
for the bony fish body fossil ghost lineage. So rather than the body fossil record extending back to just 400 million years ago, movement of Saurolepids extends it back to 425 million years ago. And this is a little bit earlier than the now oldest lobefin fish fossil. So this is quite a nice picture of filling in these gaps. Um, but it answers that one question and throws up a huge number of additional questions relating to broader patterns of evolution in bony fishes. And these include questions relating to the cranial innovations that are driving the success, why are lobefin fishes more diverse than brayfin fishes in the earliest part of their history? And how is the fauna of the South China block linked to the faunas that we see elsewhere? So some great advances are being made in filling in the earliest bony fish record. But as I mentioned, there are also major gaps in the early raven fish crown. So if we look at fossil data, the, uh, the oldest fossil in the raven fish crown that is, generally, uh, that is generally accepted to branch within the living radiation is about 384 million years old. So this gives us a minimum age for the crown. It must be at least 384 million years old. But divergence estimates from molecular analyses vary wildly. They vary from 298 million years, so the Permian, way back to 406, 436 million years, way back in the Silurian. So there's this huge range of overlapping discrepant, uh, discrepant ages for the, the age of the crown node. Why is this? So partly it's because different studies use different methods. They're using different ways of assessing the molecular clock. But a major region, as I mentioned before, is the terrible Cladistian fossil record. We have this quarter of a billion year ghost lineage. And this makes it very difficult to identify fossils to calibrate those deep nodes within the molecular, molecular divergence analyses. So I work with colleagues in the US and China to re-examine previously described fossils from the Triassic of China. And this work flagged up some surprising similarities between these fossils that I'm looking at. So for example, this is an animal called Fukang ichthys. Um, so similarities between this animal and Cladistians. And previous to this, the oldest known Cladistian fossil was about 100 million years. Um, but we identified huge similarities in the brain case, the lower jaw, and the gill skeleton, amongst others. Again, I won't go into boring anatomical detail, but you're more than welcome to come and talk to me if you want me to tell you more. Um, and when we analyze these, uh, these new characters in the context of a phylogenetic relationship, we get some pretty amazing results starting to pop out. So there's a busy slide coming up. Don't worry too much about the details. But there are two takeaway points. So firstly, in robustly identifying this fossil, Fukengekthus, as a stem cladistian, we fill in a 150 million year gap in the stem of that group. So we extend the fossil back record back from 100 million years to 250 million years. Secondly, we shunt a huge number of taxa from the crown of the bony fish, uh, from the crown of the raven fish total group onto the stem. Um, so everything that has a, a circle around it in the, in the red thing was previously thought to branch within the crown, but we are now reassigned to the stem. So what's the effect of this radical reorganization of the raven tree on the age of the crown radiation? So the fossil-based minimum age from our, our analysis has decreased by some 50 million years with respect to previous hypotheses. But of course, we can't just take the age of the oldest fossil within the crown as, as a kind of record of the age of the crown. So we conducted some divergence analyses. And these divergence analyses recovered a much younger age. So the age that we recovered is about 30 million years than the, the sort of average of recent hypotheses. And this is far more in line with the age of the fossils that we see. There are also important implications for the age of internal nodes. So for example, we recover the age of the Telios node as 50 million years younger than previous analyses have suggested. And importantly, this reanalysis brings the age of the reef and fish crown in line with the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. And this marks an important shift in early Actinopterygian evolution. Raven fishes are a fairly minor component of the Devonian, so there are only around 20 to 30 species known. But in contrast, they're taxonomically dominant in the Carboniferous, with around 200 to 300 species known. And it's not just that they increase in taxonomic diversity, there's also a huge increase in the range of morphologies and presumably ecologies within the group. So we go from an assemblage of mostly fusiform, generally fish-shaped things in the Devonian, to anatomically disparate lineages in the Carboniferous. These include deep-bodied and long-bodied lineages, very small and very large things, and everything in between. 
And this set the stage for the subsequent success of Actinopterygians, which of course is still the, the dominant uh, group of marine vertebrates, or aquatic vertebrates to this day. And as I said, punctuating these two periods is one of the big five mass extinctions, the Endivonian mass extinction. And the effect of this extinction on wraith and fishes is quite poorly understood, but is thought to be quite significant. This that we see is similar to other adaptive radiations that have been identified in the fossil record. For example, the radiation of, of, birds, and non of birds after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. But there's a lot of debate about the underlying phylogenetic structure of these radiations. Is it a single survivor lineage that makes it through and radiates? Or are there multiple cryptic divergences happen happening before the extinction boundary? Or is it something in between? So in the case of wraith and fishes, hypotheses of relationships have almost exclusively supported the former of these two scenarios. In particular, work from the uh, results from the work I just showed suggest a very stark pattern. When we time calibrate this tree, it indicates that just a single lineage appears to survive the Endivonia mass extinction, with radiation occurring after it in the early Carboniferous. So this indicates that wraith and fishes were really hard hit by the Endivonian. And as hypotheses go, this is quite attractive. It mirrors other narratives of a single plucky survivor making it through the boundary and radiating in a post-extinction world. And it shows some similarities with narratives inferred for other groups. For example, the radiation of mammals after the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. But there are a few problems here. We actually have a very poor fossil record of raven fishes just before the Endivonian mass extinction. Most of our understanding of the group is from older Franian um, examples, such as this beautiful go go fish described, uh, shown here. So, some of my current work is investigating small body taxa from just before the extinction boundary. This is an example here. It was discovered um, in, the late, in, sorry, in the early 1900s. There was a very small picture of it in a monograph, and it was then locked away in a cabinet in MCZ. And no one's really worked on it because it's absolutely tiny. So the entire fish is about six millimeters in length. And we CT scanned it. And if anyone can see any bones in that picture, I'll buy you a beer later or a drink of your choice. The vo even at scanning it at the highest possible resolution we could for the longest possible time, the bone is often only one voxel thick in the slices. So it's an incredibly challenging thing to work with. The head is about half a millimeter in length. So it's essentially the size of your fingernail. But despite the tiny size, it's a really beautiful fossil. We've got, a nearly, we've got a completely articulated head in there with almost all of the bones preserved. And it, preserves, it shows some really surprising features. So it has a number of features that are not really known in Devonian taxa. So for example, these suborbitals, these are a series of bones behind the eye, and features of the brain case, among others. So these anatomical features that are known in Carboniferous things, but had previously thought to be absent in Devonian fossils. So what's the effect of this new taxon on our hypothesis of extinction? The previous hypothesis was that only one taxon made it through the boundary. But when we add this and other small taxa which have previously been excluded, we get a very different picture. Mostly what we get is a huge rake, as I'm sure many of you can see from that slide. This is because there are a couple of wildcard taxa that are known from very, very limited remains. When you take those out, you get a similar but slightly more resolved result. But it, basically, the message is that multiple, lots of diversification happened before the extinction boundary, and multiple lineages made it across. And those lineages radiated independently in the aftermath of the Endivonian mass extinction. So this has really major ramifications for understanding how badly raffins were affected, as well as for rates of extinction and diversification. It seems that our understanding of the early evolutionary history of raffin fishes is strongly biased by a better understanding of well-preserved but much older fossils. And we need to look at these late Devonian taxa, these really tiny ones, to really understand what's going on. So one other important strand that has come out of this new hypothesis of relationships is the sudden proliferation of taxa that are on the wraith and fish stem. So previously, we, only, we thought that we only had taxa branching within the crown, which means that any innovations that go on before the living groups originated was lost to us. But we now have this brand new window into evolution before the origin of the living groups. Um, and this is the bit that I'd ask you not to, to tweet, please, or take photographs of. So as part of this uh, kind of new hypothesis of relationships, I've essentially been scanning all, any and all three-dimensionally preserved heads that I could get my hands on. And this is conjunction, in conjunction with collaborators around the world, but particularly in America. 
And a particularly interesting fossil that I wanted to mention is this. So this was found just a few miles north of Manchester and is curated in the Manchester Museum. And it's been described previously a few times and it's been given several different names. And it's something that we CT scanned because it was three dimensional, it's quite small. We didn't really expect anything interesting to come out of it, but it's nice to have the data. So we did our typical thing of scanning it, segmenting it. This is the endocast, so an, uh, an infilling of the endocranial cast, which is typically thought to be a fairly good model for what the brain would have looked like. You can see uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the olfactory tracts going up, so anterior is at the top, and the semicircular canal is very large. And then on the right, it's in lateral view, with anterior pointing towards your left. So as we were working through the data, we found something slightly interesting in the cranial cavity. You can see this very bright, very X-ray dense, three, uh, bilaterally symmetrical structure inside. And again, we can look in sagittal section and we see it again, this very small bilaterally symmetrical feature within the uh, endocavity. cavity. And it turns out that this is a fossilized brain. So this is the oldest fossil vertebrate brain that is known. Um, it's three-dimensionally preserved. It's bilaterally symmetrical. You can see the cranial nerves leading from the brain to the exits through the brain case. So for example, the optic nerve, the vagus nerve, um, even the octavolateralis nerve. And it's amazingly well preserved. We can compare it to extant taxa. So for example, this is a petuicus, a cladistian on the, on the left. And we can see a number of similarities, but also a number of great differences. So this is really revolutionary for understanding when and how key features of the ray fin fish brain evolved. And this past work on ray fin fishes that I've talked about has set the stage for, for interpretation of the earliest members of the group. And in particular, it set the stage for future macroevolutionary analyses. Um, and these are things that I'm going to be working on in, in the future. So we can ask about how these functional innovations, particularly with regard to, to feeding mechanisms, contribute to reef and fish diversity. We still need to tackle how some of these living lineages evolve from this haze of fossils. We want to know in more detail how reef and fishes are affected by mass extinction events, and what are the patterns of dispersal <coughs> into new environments. And I have a new PhD student starting very soon, Stuart Henderson, who is talking on uh, Friday afternoon, I think. So Thursday afternoon, I don't know. What's that? Poster. poster. He has a poster. Um, and it's on Poro Leper forms, and it will be very excellent. Uh, and he will hopefully be answering some of these excellent questions. So just to sum up, bony fishes account for 99% of living vertebrate diversity, and raven fishes are a staggering 50% of those. The advent of, of three-dimensional uh, CT scanning really allows us to examine a lot of these hypotheses in a new light, and often sh flip the hypotheses on their head. Um, we need to have robust hypotheses of relationships before we can do any kind of broad-scale macroevolutionary patterns. We can't work out what's happening on a large scale until we know how things are related to each other, both fossils to each other and fossils to the living things. And reef and fishes have this vast evolutionary history of nearly half a billion years, so they're a fantastic group to do these kinds of analyses on. As Rob alluded to at the start, my lab will be moving to the University of Birmingham just next month. So I'm really keen to talk to uh, students and postdocs who might be interested in writing fellowship applications to come and work with me. So come and grab me at some point in the meeting. Thank you.